I'm Richard Gibson uh, and I'm currently head of animal care and conservation. That means all of the animal teams, the veterinary team and all of the, the field and international conservation work that we do. I didn't start here in that role. I came to New Zealand about 10 years ago. Um, I'm a, a, a reptile specialist, a herpetologist by training and by career. My favourite thing in the world is snakes. Yet I came to New Zealand. I, I visited here a year before I moved here and I saw there was an opportunity here at Auckland Zoo to do something that I've not really seen any other zoo do and that is to seamlessly integrate field conservation, field activities, field work, get an out there at the coalface into the daily activities of being a zookeeper. Uh, and many zoos do field work and have field programs, but it's kind of, in most zoos, it's kind of either an occasional perk or it's done by a team of specialist field team that are not part of the animal care team. And we really feel that there is a, a skill set that is continuous and that if you can be a good zookeeper, you can be a good field conservationist. If you can be a good field conservationist, you can be a good zookeeper. And so we really wanted to make that a reality. And uh, Auckland and New Zealand more broadly are both cursed and blessed with having a plethora of endangered species right here on our doorstep. We've been able to grow a fieldwork program that is just part of daily zoo life. And if that's, that's as close to unique in the zoo world as anything is, I think. And it's something that is pretty special. And that's why I came here, not for the snakes. This beautiful space is Narepo, the, the wetland. And this wetland, Avery, as you can hear, has a beautiful waterfall and is, is home to a number of mostly waterfowl. Also Kingfisher and is sitting up on that perch at the moment. You can just see it there in the sun. Animals in New Zealand are really hard to see. Even in the zoo, they're quite hard to see. And so for me, Te Wanui is really about immersing people in, an, in a New Zealand landscape and, and the feel of New Zealand, the, the architecture, the, the, the culture, the spirit of, of New Zealand. And the animals are almost like the icing on the cake. Te Wanui is now 10 years old. I arrived in New Zealand almost exactly the same time as Te Wanui was coming to completion, maybe three weeks before opening. We opened with around 50 species. I guess those 50 species are probably about half birds and a half reptiles, fish, and invertebrates and amphibians. A few notable additions over the years, of course, have been the Wetapunga and the Wetapunga program. Tiaki or the Saddleback, incredible forest icon. A pair of Kakariki Karaka or the orange-fronted parakeet. And also a pair of Takahe. These are incredibly rare and threatened New Zealand species. This monstrous eel, grown up to sometimes almost two meters in length, these beautiful creatures are endemic to New Zealand. They take 50, 60 or even 70 years to mature and they spend that time in our rivers and our streams and our lakes and eventually when they get an unknown signal to reproduce they go through a morphological change, they leave their water bodies and they start migrating towards the ocean and they find all the way, all the way to the sea and they swim all the way to Tonga and their eggs and drift back towards New Zealand in the currents. It's an incredible cycle, an incredible story but currently our populations are in decline and the species is considered threatened. People spend a long time here and they're, they're one of our favourites and I think that's amazing and it's a real good example of what the, the power of a zoo can be. It's, it's giving people an opportunity to, to see and connect with wildlife they wouldn't normally see. One of the ways we support conservation um, outside of the zoo gates uh, and, and even outside of New Zealand is through our conservation fund. And so with, when Te Nui came online, um, we loosely derived a sort of uh, a, a inspiration, if you like, from the different zones of Te Wanui to drive our field programme. We can't do it alone, of course. Our key partner inevitably is DOC. DOC are legally responsible for the wildlife of New Zealand, and we work incredibly closely with them uh, on pretty much everything we do. And so we have field programmes throughout the North Island, field programmes all the way down through the South Island. We have programmes where we're just doing research. We have programmes where we're reintroducing species. We have programmes where we're doing pest control. Um, we have programmes where we are the lead, if you want to call it that, where it's our project in terms of it's been our idea and we're taking the lead role in it. And we have projects where we're just a partner with someone else. We work with all sorts of things, plants, fish, reptiles, invertebrates, birds. There are species here at the zoo that are in offshore areas that we're doing important conservation work for here in the zoo that some of our, that, that our visitors really never get to see. This is home to a cobble skink. 
that operates like the wild from a skink's perspective. We have a, a, a deep substrate that is thermally stable and it's free draining, and it's just coarse enough to make sure their claws don't get overgrown. We have native sprawling bushes that provide shade and cover, and they also present, they actually fruit and produce food. We have fresh water and these very important, these refuges, and these refuges provide them protection from the hot weather and also protection from the cold weather. These hides are quite complicated. They're multiple layers. They have a roof, as you can see. See the little um, stairs. Let's them climb up and down. They're, I think, probably female, judging by the size of it, an adult female cobble skink. This is Angeline roofing tile, and uh, it gets quite warm in the sun, so in coolish weather, it's a nice place for the lizards to hide. You can see, even just looking for the skinks in these enclosures, it's quite sometimes challenging to find them. See how cryptic or secretive they are, and so surveying for skinks like this in the wild is pretty time consuming and it's a labour of love. The cobble skink, uh, known from a tiny, tiny, tiny little patch of beach near Granity. Um, we feared that cyclones actually wiped that species completely off the face of the wild. And so it was very lucky that all the skinks they could find were moved here to Auckland Zoo. It was only 37 skinks. Since those storms and since those animals were brought here, there hasn't been another cobble skink seen in their habitat. So we have this safety net here at the zoo and we hope very much to be able to put those animals back to the wild one day. You know, multidisciplinary, multi-partner programs can make a real big difference to a species extinction risk and its long-term survival. This is the uh, kind of the sharp end of the stick with the Cobble and Chesterfield skink story. January, we bring the gravid or pregnant females into this environment where they finish off the last few weeks of their pregnancy in this space. And the reason we do that with the females is we want the babies to be born indoors because the babies, and I'm not joking, are about the size of a matchstick. So we want to rear every baby successfully and give every baby the best start in life. And so we have the mothers give birth under control conditions in here. So everything is provided in here for them, but in a way that it's up to us so we can ensure they're always within that nice little envelope of ideal temperature, humidity and basking options. I think probably despite being a herpetologist, a reptile man, uh, the programme of which it's hard not to be the most uh, enthused and proud is the Wetapunga programme for Auckland Zoo. The Wetapunga is, or it was, critically endangered. It used to be throughout Northland and the top half of Auckland and on the offshore islands. And of course, as a result of introduced predators and deforestation and agriculture and land use change, etc., it became extinct everywhere except for Hautudu Otoi. And from there, we've been able to harvest small numbers of adult founder breeders and those founders we've been able to magically turn into more than 6,000 Wetapunga that we've now reintroduced to five islands across the Hodaki and most recently three islands up in the Bay of Islands. This is an adult female giant Weta or Wetapunga. Magnificent creature. Their only real defense is these lovely spiky legs which you can imagine for a little bird that thinks it might make a meal of it is pretty distressing and is probably a good deterrent but for a stoat or a cat or a rat, it's just absolutely no use at all. And for predators that hunt by smell, like mammals, these things are just rich and easy pickings and the, the wetter are entirely defenseless. So let me show you a little bit. At the moment we've got um, in these enclosures here and here, a single animal. These are wild caught adult animals that were taken off Hautuda Otoi under permit for this program. Uh, the females lay their eggs into these egg fields. We leave those in the, in the enclosures for a month or so, and then every month or so we take it out with the eggs. And then those egg fields will just sit here quietly in these same temperature but humid environment, and it will take six to 12 months for the eggs to hatch. Everything we do at Auckland Zoo is about conservation. We educate and we advocate for conservation. We connect people with wildlife because we hope they will care about wildlife and do their own conservation. We do science and, and publish occasionally our research and, and, and that's in support of learning more about the wildlife we work with and the wildlife around us and being able to conserve it. And we also do hands-on, we get out in the field and we do that conservation. All those things are part of being a good modern zoo. I've been in in and around zoos for almost 30 years. Auckland Zoo is now, I think, the longest I've been in one place. I'm just a little one cog in a big complicated machine, 
But for me, what gets me out of bed and makes me stay in this career is knowing that I'm making a bit of a difference to some of those species. Some of them wouldn't probably be here in the near future if it hadn't been for the work Auckland Zoo had done with Doc and everybody else. But if it hadn't been for some of the stuff we do, some of those species might be gone five years, 10 years from now. You know, it's always interesting to dwell on where we've come from. Obviously, this is our centennial, our 100 year anniversary. Uh, and we've been through the, the sorts of evolution we've seen many good zoos go through from, from menageries through to scientific collections through to carefully planned out and thoughtfully and actively um, um, advanced conservation breeding programs and conservation education programs and scientific institutions. And I think that that evolution, let's hope, continues. Uh, and so it makes my mind hurt to think about where we might be in the next 50 to 100 years. I obviously won't be around to see it, but I very much hope we see the same sort of commitment and, and evolution in, in the zoo and what the zoo is doing in the next hundred years and that I can continue to feel that I've been a part of not only where we are now, but hoping to, 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 to model us for the future.